Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, welcome to everyone online, uh, everyone on the Zoom, everyone in this room. Um, <laughs> lovely to see new faces. Bless you, sis. And uh, yeah, like Jack said, um, it's wonderful to be here together, together. And uh, we do this because our Lord um, instructs us to and it pleases Him. And it's wonderful to gather together on His blessed uh, Shabbat. Um, I always like to begin and to remind ourselves of the, basically the theme of scriptures. It's the creed that we uh, try to adhere to here at Almond House. It's the Shema. Um, and it's our creed because it's the Bible's creed. And this is how it goes in Hebrew. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Ve'chavta et Adonai Elohecha, v'kol levavcha, u'v'kol nefshecha. And in English it is Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Um, it's easier said than done, we know this. But um, that is the creed, and that's what we uh, try to adhere to, we try our best to stick to. So we're at, we are now this week on Parsha Devarim. Devarim, which is both the title for this, um, the last book in the, 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 the scroll of the Torah. It's the fifth one. And it's also the title of this Torah portion, uh, which begins the book of Deuteronomy. This word Devarim means words. And f strangely enough, um, it also means bees. Uh, Devarim in Hebrew also means bees. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that briefly later on. As I said in English, this book here is called uh, Deuteronomy. And it's derived from the, the Greek Septuagint for the, um, of Deuteronomus, Deuteronomus, which itself comes from another ancient Greek word, uh, Deuteron Deuteronomion, which means repetition or copy. And it's referring to the law, the Torah. So it's a repetition or a copy of the law. That's what it means in Greek. Therefore, it became known as the second law. Deuteronomy means the second law. But for me, this sounds like it's a replacement. For me, it sounds as if the original Torah has, been, has now been superseded. So personally, I think the translation should be a repetition of the law, a, a copy of the, the law or the Torah, you know. So, yeah, Devarim, words. You know, in life we can say, well, it's all about Jesus, it's all about God, and it's true. You could say, it's all about the scriptures. And sometimes in life you hear people saying, it's all about timing, you know. And these things are all true. But also, what's true is it's all about words. It, it truly is. Um, looking into this passage, it became more and more apparent that really words are so very powerful. Uh, words can transform lives, you know. Words can transform lives. And in the beginning was the word. Straight from the beginning. Also we read in scriptures that man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Words are very powerful. God spoke all things into existence through his words. And, you know, that's a big key right there. I mean, you could just say that alone and realise how extremely important and powerful words are. Um, death and life, we know this from scriptures, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. In other words, that the words that we use. We see that in Proverbs 18. Um, words are everywhere. Um, words can be spoken. Words can be sung. Words can sting and words can heal. I'm talking about bees, Devarim. Words can sting and yet words can heal. Words can be heard. Words can be read. And words can be written. And in the Bible we're told that every writing is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for conviction, for setting a right, for instruction that is in righteousness. By the way, that was Jung's literal translation. That, that was their version. I chose that one because it, it seems to 
say it perfectly. And these words, God writes the words of the Torah on our hearts. And we know that Yeshua himself, he is the word. He's the word. And his words are light. The light of this world. His words are living water. So words, or Devarim, as the, the Pasha goes, are very powerful. I just wanted to outline that before we went into the Pasha. So let's preview now what we're going to read. Uh, this, this book of Devarim begins in the 40th year since the exodus from Egypt. It's on the first day of the 11th month and it's actually 37 days before Moses will die. Uh, overall, the book has a, a tone of a, a farewell speech. It's like Moses' final discourse uh, to the people. But unlike the previous four books, uh, which were, were rendered in the third person, the speaker in Devarim is Moses himself. It's, it's, it's spoken in the first person. I, 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 etc. Um, it begins with Moses reviewing the events that occurred in the course of their 40 year journey from Egypt to Sinai. And then from Sinai onto the land of Moab. The Parsha opens with the Israelites in the land of Moab, just east of the Jordan, shortly before they would enter the Promised Land. Right on the edge there, on the verge, you know. Can you imagine what it must have felt? But because Moses wasn't allowed to enter the land, he begins by making plain the Torah, as it's written, to the people, so that they would clearly recall God's instructions once they took possession of the land. So the partial and brief, we read of the leaving of Sinai, the appointing of leaders, the sin of the spies, rebellion at Kadesh Barnea, the penalty of Israel's unbelief, we read of the wilderness years, the, the defeat of Sihon the king, the defeat of Og the king, the allotments for the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, and it culminates with the message delivered to Moses' successor, Joshua, who was charged with leading the people into the promised land. So there is, a, as always, there's, it's chock a block there, the parsha. Um, we're mainly going to focus on the first two chapters. It's it's three chapters long, but we mainly covered the first two because of um, restrictions of the time we have. We can't possibly cover everything. Uh, we'll probably be here till next week, actually. Yeah, and that's why it's a Torah cycle. It comes round and it comes round and it comes round and round and round and round. And round and we get to the summit and we get closer to God. And things have revealed more and more and more. So we couldn't possibly do it anyway if we wanted, even if we tried. So let's look at the Hebrew perspective of this Parsha, Devarim. As I said, the title for the Parsha in Hebrew comes from the opening phrase of the book which says, These are the words, Devarim, which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness. Now we're in the fifth book of the Torah. This word, Devarim, is the plural of the word, Dabar which itself means things like speech, commandment, word, etc. Now, an ancient name for the book of Deuteronomy, which is, uh, as it's known in English, is the Mishnei HaTorah, Mishnei HaTorah, which means, quote, repetition of the Torah. Now, bear in mind what I've just said before, you're thinking, well, is it a repetition? Or is it a review or is it an explanation? Because all these three terms have already been used in the prelude to this. But for me, Deuteronomy is far more than a repetition or a mere repetition of the Torah of Moses. In fact, most matters are not even repeated. Most events and most of the mitzvot are not even repeated. So really it's not a repetition. It is rather, it's more of a, a rehearsal and the reminder of, of the law, of the Torah, since don't forget many of the younger Israelites had never heard it before. Because yeah. uh, they, they, they were born since Sinai. 
And although this term Mishne HaTorah means a repeat of the Torah, let's look a bit further into this word Mishne in Hebrew. It's derived from the root, the root word La Shanein, La Shanein, meaning to repeat. But Devarim is not a repeat. It contains a list of the commandments that need to be repeated. That's what it is. So rather than a repetition, it contains a list of commandments that need to be repeated every day. So this Mishneh Torah doesn't refer, it doesn't re refer to a repeat of earlier laws, but to a set of laws that need to be repeated. That's where the repetition comes in. Moses himself tells us further down in Deborah in chapter 6, he says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. But it says, teach them to your children. This verb, teach, can also be repeat them to your children. So this is the whole crux of the matter. Mm. It's not strictly a repetition of the law, but a reminder of the law that must be repeated. See the, 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 the subtle difference. But having said that, there are things that we do not repeat. And Moses goes on to remind the whole people of past indiscretions. So in this instance, he's saying, don't keep repeating them. He reminds them of certain transgressions that the people went through. We're going to come to that shortly. But he's saying, do not repeat. Learn from other people's mistakes. And really, this is what we also do in the scriptures. When we read the scriptures, <coughs> the best method in life is to learn from mistakes that others have made. And we read in Romans 15, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Other people's experiences in the past, whether they're good or bad, are meant to teach us how to build a future. Okay, so hopefully uh, that, that look into the Hebrew nuances uh, helps us all to see that uh, the, the purpose and the meaning of this Parsha and Deuteronomy, so-called. It's not quite how the, the Greek translation has it. It's a repetition of what we are, it's a, a reminder of what we are supposed to repeat. Okay, so let's dive in. We're gonna start. Uh, Deborim, Deuteronomy chapter one. I'm gonna read through the whole chapter here. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hatarot, and Dizahab. It's 11 days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them, after he had killed Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt at Ashtaroth in Edrei. On this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey, and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighbouring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowlands, in the south and on the sea coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? 
Choose wise, understanding and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment, you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. So we departed from Horeb, and went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites, as the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, You have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, let us send men before us, and let them search out the land for us, and bring back word to us of the way by which we shall go up, and of the cities into which we shall come. The plan pleased me well, so I took twelve of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed and went up into the mountains, and came to the valley of Eshkol, and spied it out. They also took some of the fruits of the land in their hands, and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us, saying, It is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. Nevertheless, you wouldn't go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discovered us to our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we've seen the sons of Anakim there. Then I said to you, Do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you, according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to set out a place for you, to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your words, and was angry, and took an oath, saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry, angry with me for your sakes, saying, Even you shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there, to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And when every one of you had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, Tell them, Do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountain. And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do, and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days, according to the days that you spent there. So we see here, Moses is reviewing past 
events, etc. Now, if you return here to the very first verse, so chapter 1, verse 1. In the plain opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazarot, and Dizahab. Now, apparently, these the place names here listed are, are not landmarks. Uh, they're not landmarks indicating where Moses spoke these words. In fact, some of the places don't even exist. They're not to ge uh, geographical locations. But these are words of reproof by Moses to the people. And what he does here, he uses his words. They're the title of the pastor. He uses his Devarim in a, a certain way here. He, he alludes to their sins or the sins of the previous generation with these place names, quote, in the desert, which refers to the time that they complained when they said, if only we would have died in the desert. And then he says, in the Arabah, or in the plain, this is where they worship Baal Peor, in the plains of Moab. Then he says, opposite Suf, this is another where they once again they complained. Remember at the the shores of Yam Suf, the shores of the Red Sea. Then he mentions Paran, which is referring to the, the sin of the spies who were sent from Paran. And then he mentions Tophel and Lavan. This is in reference to their the impious slander of the white manna. This Tophel is like something unseemly, unsavory, and the, the Lavan means white. So it's a reference to the slander of the manna. And then you have Hatarot, which is the scene of Korach's rebellion. And finally, with Dishahav, which means too much gold. It's a reference to the sin of the golden calf. So Moses has used words very cleverly, cleverly here, and lovingly, actually. He's given, the remi uh, he's given the people reminders. It's a rebuke, but it's done gently through allusions. Um, and you might say, well, hang on, th these, these, these transgressions were the previous generation. Why is he saying it to these, the younger ones now? And it's a valid question. You know, why are you highlighting these transgressions to these people now? Well, the truth is, their story, even sitting here now, their story, good or bad, is our story. Whether it's one generation away or a hundred generations away. Also, this generation now will all will now understand that there's always hope. That th despite the transgressions of their ancestors, God will be with them if they trust in him. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's still hope here. See what happened there, but look. It's like from death to life, from being lost to being found. You know, he's given them hope. And we have to realise also that this new generation, they've risen directly after the failings of the previous generation and even though that generation was wiped out these now have an opportunity to rebuild the relationship with God Moses is revealing to them through his it's an astute application of words actually that there's always hope and that destruction is for the purpose of rebuilding that destruction is for the purpose of renewal. There's also another lesson here. It's not just the words, the Devarim, that we choose, it's how we use them. We spoke at the beginning how powerful words are and there's actual life and death in them. So we have to be careful not just what words we choose but also how we use them. Moses could easily have highlighted every sin explicitly. The golden calf, remember? The sitting with them and the spies and the bad report he brought back. He didn't do it like that. Instead, he uses his words wisely and lovingly to allow the hearer to acknowledge and receive whilst he's still sparing their feelings of guilt. You see, you can teach someone lovingly. You don't have to keep pointing fingers. He, he just made allusions here. He chose his words wisely and applied them lovingly. It's the power of words, how subtle they are. So we're not here to fill others with guilt and regret. That's not what it's about. We're here to inspire people 
to learn and to grow. And that's what Moses is doing here. And this is achieved through love and patience and wisdom, through godly words. Proverbs 15, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. That word there, wholesome, most, well, some versions say soothing or healing. I think healing is probably more apt. A healing tongue is a tree of life. So yeah, these are just wonderful examples of um, the choice of words and the use of words that is displayed here by Moses. Just love and wisdom. Verse 5. Moses began to explain this law. Moses began to explain this law. This word here, explain, is a, it's be'er in the Hebrew. And it comes from another Hebrew word, ba'ah. It's spelled the same, pronounced slightly differently. So explain, be'er, from the word ba'ah. But it also, it's the same word for a well. You know, a well of water. <laughs> and then explain this law, which we know as the Torah. Now the word for rain shares the same root as the word for Torah. So basically Moses here, we don't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew it comes alive. Moses here is pouring the living water of the Torah on the people. Wow. That's another way of saying Moses began to explain this law. He's literally pouring the living water of the Torah over the people. So straight away I have a connection, the Torah, the words of Moses, the words of God, the word of God, Yeshua, our salvation. And we read in Isaiah 12, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Yeshua is the living water. He's our salvation. He washes, he cleanses, he gives life, he sustains life. So what we see here in verse 5 is that Moses is expounding of the words of the Torah brings, way, brings life to whoever receives it. Moving on to verses 6 and 7. The Lord our God spoke to us on Hereb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey. And then we see a list of places. Basically, take your journey elsewhere to other places, far and wide. That was the instruction here. Now, we hear and we guard and we do the words of God. But they're not solely for us. For, they're not solely for you online or for you on the Zoom or for us in the room. We're instructed to water the world with his word. We are instructed to shine the light of his word to others. So he's saying here, turn and take your journey. You've been at the mountain. You know, you, you know the truth. You know the word. Go out and take it out now. We don't just meet here every Shabbat. And return home thinking, yeah, I'm special. I study the word of God. You know, it's, it's not what it's about. We are to live for others. Yeshua himself didn't, didn't limit the gospel to himself and the twelve closest to him. So neither should we. He himself says in Mark, and this is the Aramaic Bible and plain English version. Yeshua said to them, Go to the entire world and preach my good news in all creation. God says, You've dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey. Being at the mountain is wonderful. You know, it's... Um, and I can understand wanting to remain there ad infinitum. You know, it's it's like being here in a way. When I'm here, I don't really want to be anywhere else. It's just, it's just, you know. Probably when I'm here, I'm closer to God than at any other time, really. Because um, we gather here for God. We're two or more are gathered in his name. He is in the midst. Where we're, we're, we're speaking the word of life. And it's just a... So I can understand when... You had to be told, look, you've been at the mountain long enough. Just move along now. Nest. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Fly the nest. Fly the nest. Just um, in, yeah. yeah, just that verse there. It's just beautiful. Um, go to the entire world and preach my good news in all creation. Yeah. You know, it's not just mankind there, is it? It's, yeah, it's all creation. It's all creation. Yes. And I think we can express God's love 
to you know to animals to to nature to to all different aspects of life mm-hmm. um so yeah, I, I love that verse because it, it shows it's not just our words how we can express the gospel yeah. because uh, you know animals or plants they may not understand you or the english language but they can it's, it's a truth they can, they can feel the expression yeah. of god's love we can't say we yeah we love god and then you just hate your neighbor it's written you know you can't love god and hate your brother so it's the same you can't love god and say oh these blinking dogs these they stink or whatever or get that get that cat away from me it doesn't make sense like you said it's all god's creation it's all god's creation you know so um <laughs> It took me a long while to, to acknowledge that one, actually. I used to be, um, we were talking before, weren't we? When um, you'd be in someone's home and the dog bounds up to you. Yeah. It could be like the size of a horse. And they're saying, it's all right, it doesn't bite, and I'm just slobbering all over you. <laughs> and you're thinking, I'd rather you bit me, to be honest. I mean, I'm just drenched in dog spit. You know, I, I, for years I used to think, oh no, just keep it away from me. And But now, um, it's all Lord, he changes lives, he transforms people, doesn't he? You know, I, I was the I, I couldn't bear to be by dogs and now I just love every creature on this planet. I really do, from a from a worm or a slug to a giraffe. I love God's creatures, I really do. As long as they don't bite me like but you know, or slobber all over me. <laughs> but it's the truth. We we um, share it with all creation. You can't love God and pretend and just hate something. I, that belongs to his creation. It doesn't make. It doesn't add up. It doesn't add. Love is love. You know, we hate evil, not God's creation. We are to love God and our neighbour, and all of God's creation actually. And this means giving cups of water to his children. You know, we want to stay at the mountain, but we're supposed to travel on and bring water to the world. And God will reward you. As you assume himself, he uh, promises us in Matthew and in Mark 9, For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. There are eter- no means, you will not lose your reward. This reward is eternal. There are eternal rewards for spreading the words of the gospel of Yeshua. We've been given water, we've been given water to overflowing. Let us share it with others. And that's what the message is here in uh, these verses. And it's, 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 a, it's a strange uh, truth. If I've got a cup of water here, now if I share that with Callum and with Jack, and there's going to be none left. But with the water of the word, the more you share, it just keeps brimming up and brimming up. It's just overflowing. Mm. It, it never goes. It's the same with love. The more love you give out, the more you've still got left to give. It just brims over and over. This is that's a living miracle. That's a daily miracle. It's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> water itself is a miracle. It truly is. You know, it yeah. truly is. Try making, try making water. You won't do it. Okay, let's move on. Um, verse thirteen, still in the first chapter. Choose wise, understanding and knowledgeable men from among your tribes and I will make them heads over you. Some says make them rulers over you, some versions. Now once again in the Hebrew, where it says, and I will make them or I will place them. This is Vaisamem. And in the Hebrew, it's, it's, it's lacking one letter. It's the smallest letter in the Hebrew language. It's the letter Yod. It looks like, an, in English, it looks like a, an apostrophe. Mm. You know, you'll have seen it. For anyone who's had a little look at the Hebrew alphabet, it's the one that looks like an apostrophe. It's the letter Yod. Symbolises the hand, etc. So because it's written like that, the sentence can also be, that way can also be pronounced, Va'ashamam. And therefore, it'll change the meaning of the sentence slightly. So instead of saying, I will make them rulers over you, it would says, and their guilt rules over you. Wow. Now this, it's amazing the Hebrew language, but it really is, but this wonderful flexibility and the richness in the Hebrew language uh, teaches us in this instance that the faults of a generation generally rest with the rulers. Mm-hmm. It's up, their guilt, you know, is up, the guilt is upon them. Mm-hmm. It's not always, but in general. And for me, this is referring to worldly rulers, not godly rulers. But it's, it's the smallest letter, this Yod, and yet it makes such a big difference. 
It's um, even a comma or no comma in the scriptures mm -hmm. can make a world of difference. You know the verse I mean, Sandy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One comma yeah. can make the world of difference, whether it's in or, whether, or you put it here or you put it mm -hmm. there or you take it out, you put it in. A world of difference. Yeah. And that comma also looks like the letter Yod. What's the um, the biggest word in English language? The biggest? I can't say. <laughs> if. 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 Okay. It's only a small <laughs> word. It's only a small word, but little things mean a lot. That word if. I was going to say super colour, fragilistic, <laughs> sp espialidosis. The, 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 point, the point being that small things mean a lot. They really do. Um, now speaking about these ungodly rulers that we just mentioned, in the next chapter we're going to talk about, we're going to read about the, the descendants of Esau. So I want to I return to that theme of rulers as opposed to the common people. Okay, so bear that in mind. Okay, moving on to verse 16. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. Now, over and over, just, we've spoken on this many times, but I think the fact that it keeps popping up, warrants mentioned again, over and over, so many times right through our scriptures, again and again, we're instructed, aren't we, to treat this stranger justly. And even more than that, we're told to love the stranger, you know. Well, in this partia, we're also going to see how strangers treat us justly and with love. We see that in this partia. But this is, a, this is a creed. This is the creed of the scriptures. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself even the stranger, not just Jack, or your wife, or your best friends, even the stranger, you know. <coughs> and we know, well I know personally, often, very often it's easier said than done. Yeah, it's easier said than done. But our Lord fulfilled this mitzvah even when he was on the cross. Even when he was in excruciating pain on the cross. That word excruciating, by the way, it comes from the Latin. It means from the cross. So when something is excruciating, it's referring to the pain on the cross. That awful, dreadful pain. Excruciating, it means from the cross. But our Lord fulfilled this when he was on the cross. Remember, forgive them, they know what, know not what they do. He was praying for these people that practically, well, we know what happened, and he prayed for them. He prayed for them and he asked for forgiveness for them. No, but the bar is set high. It's easy said than done, but the bar is set high. And you know why? Because if it is any lower, we will feel pathetic for failing to attain to even that. Yeah. that. You know, the bar has to be set high. It has to be. So let's be just with the stranger, and let's love others as ourselves. It's mentioned once again here. Verse twenty-six. Nevertheless, you would not go up. But rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. So often in life our flesh is unwilling to do what is right by God. So often our flesh is unwilling. You would not go up but rebelled. Mark 14, the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. But well, here but it says you would not go up once again. Now these scriptures were originally written in Hebrew, so I, I do not apologise for keep going back to the Hebrew, because many things are lost in translation from one language to another. We've spoken on this plenty of times, and certain the essence of something or the, the nuances cannot be translated. It's practically impossible. Um, so to look into the Hebrew, you, you're going to get a truer feel and a, 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 a nearer to the truth. And here where it says, you would not go up, it's better, the better translation according to the Hebrew words would be, you were not willing to go up, you were not willing to go up. See, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he, in here with this word, for, uh, to, to will something, as in to wish or want, or to, to will it, or to be willing, is Abba, Abba, Aleph, Beit, Hey, 
three letters, Aleph, Beit, He, Abba. So you got this word for, for God, the Father, is Ab. The first two letters are Ab, Aleph and Beit, Ab. Remember Yeshua, Abba? Ab is Father. And uh, the last letter, the He, the third letter, the He, that rep represents breath or spirit. You know, we know that each letter in Hebrew has certain qualities and characteristics, etc. So we have three letters here. The first two is Ab for the Father, and then we have the He on the end, Abba. The He is his breath or spirit. When our will, when our will, what we wish and what we want, when that aligns with what God the Father wants, we experience his Ruach. Wow. See, we experience his spirit. That's the beauty of the Hebrew. God, spirit, our will, Abba. When our will aligns with what God the Father wills, we experience his breath, his spirit, his Ruach, Abba. Uh, verse 27. And you complained in your tent and said, because the Lord hates us. Now really, God loves them, but they hate him. But if twisted it round, see weird, see. Because the Lord hates us, this is going to happen and that's happened, etc. And he's going to do this. No, no. Really, God loves them, but they hate him. It's a revelation of their own hearts here. Wow, an accusation. Yeah, they're revealing their own hearts, and we've touched on this subject before, you know. It's even known in psychology and psychiatry. People accuse others of what they're guilty of themselves. Mm. But we don't need psychology and uh, psych psych psychiatry. We've got it in the Bible. We, we know from the Bible. This is a general rule of thumb. What's in your own, own heart about another? You imagine that in his, it's in his heart about you. What is in your own heart about another, you imagine is in his heart about you. So they're saying, because the Lord hates us, what they're really saying is, we hate him. We hate what he's done. We hate what he's doing. That's what they're saying. It's a revelation of their own hearts. Let our hearts be pure toward one another and toward our God. And see also the power of their words there, you know. There's death, they're speaking death basically, not life. And what comes out of the mouth is a revelation of one's heart. We have to guard the heart. Next verse, 28. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Now this Anakim is giants, real giants, real true living giants, as in very tall big people. Not like cartoons or movies, real giants on the earth, the Anakim. Now these are the descendants of the fallen angels that we read of in Genesis. This is really real. And you get movies and stuff on it that twists it and anything, it's all fiction. But these Anakim were real giants and the descendants of the fallen angels we read of in Genesis. Now we have to bear in mind that at, at this time we're talking about here in the scriptures, there existed peoples that were genetic mutations. There were genetic mutations running around. Demonic bloodlines. I mean, you only have to think of Pan. You know, we've all seen images of this, this Pan character. And just consider all of the, 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 the human-animal hybrids that you see depicted on murals and in statues and in, symb and in symbology in general, really. For the salvation of mankind, for the salvation of the human race, these would have to be removed from the earth. And God does this. And we're going to touch on this uh, shortly, in the next chapter actually. Verse 34. And the Lord heard the sound of your words. <laughs> it was really, you know, in, in life, in this dimension that we live in, that our Lord created for us to live in, Nothing really expires, nothing expires, you know. Nothing can be completely extinguished. It either remains as it is, or it transforms from one form to another. You know, that's the truth. If you burn a piece of wood, 
you know, it, it becomes light and sound and heat and smoke. You know, it no longer looks like wood, but it, it can't make it disappear. It just changes into something else. I often wonder where do our words go? Mm -hmm. You know, we speak them. I think, where do our words go? Where do they go? You know, I, I honestly think that the, the kept, the recording kept, you know. They must go somewhere. We're always being watched, and I don't mean CCTV. I mean, we're always being watched. We're always being watched. So surely we're always being heard, you know. Surely we're always being heard also. Our words are all heard. You know, there's a saying that even the walls have ears, you know. I wonder where that comes from. They, they say, well, it was World War II. It was just, you're putting gadgets in wars, etc. And it's getting recorded and beamed over here. And we knew what their plans was. But I think it comes from well before that. It's more like saying, look, we're being heard, you know. God collects our tears, doesn't he? Why wouldn't he collect our words? Yeshua and Matthew. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. By our words we're either acquitted or condemned. By our words. So they're gone somewhere, they kept somewhere. And remember in the last Pasha, is it Messiah? Uh, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Well, that's in Numbers 30, verse 2. We've got to, we must put it, we, we have to guard our words. You know, this, that's all about rash vows there. But we have to guard our words. We have to make sure our words are worthy of our Lord. You know, who we represent. Don't carry his name in vain. We represent him. We have to guard our words. Uh, 43, verse 43. I spoke to you, yet you would not listen. This is Moses speaking. Now, if we don't listen to the words of Moses, it's rebellion against God. This is what's written here. I spoke to you, yet you would not listen. And it doesn't end well. <laughs> if you don't listen to the words of Moses, it is rebellion against God, and it doesn't end well. We see here in this paragraph. It's in the very next verse, isn't it, where the Ammonites defeated us. We wouldn't listen. We wouldn't listen. Look, we've got two ears and one mouth. Two ears and one mouth. It's best we listen to twice as much as what we say. All our words are heard. Angels hear. God hears. And as we saw earlier, our words reveal our hearts. May the waters of our Lord's word purify our hearts. We need it. We need surgery on our hearts. Spiritual surgery. The Bible says it's corrupt. You know, outside in the building, say, follow your heart. No, no, don't. Follow what God says. If you follow your heart, you're going to be in a, bit of, a lot of trouble. Follow what God says. The heart's a tricky thing, man. You've got to be careful. You know, may the words of our Lord's word purify our hearts. And here's a prayer that we also pray often, especially me. Psalm one, uh, Psalm nineteen, verse fourteen. People will notice from the old song. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. See, it's all in one. It's all one. What comes out of your mouth is a revelation of your heart. May they be acceptable in our Lord's sight. That's a good prayer for us all. And verse 44. Chased you as bees do. <laughs> now at the outset, um, Pasha Devarim. And it's... it's you don't have to twist it or anything. There's no. You don't have to contrive it. This word Deborim also means bees in Hebrew. But in context, we know it's speaking about words, but it can also mean bees. And you know, bees are mentioned in the Bible, but very seldom. And there's no coincidence that they just pop up in this passage here that's called Deborim. You know, Deborim words, Deborim bees. They just pop up again. You know. Um, Bees, words, words, bees. Bees, honey, heals. Words can heal. Bees pollinate and therefore bring forth fruit. Words can bring forth fruit. 
B's enhance life. Words can enhance life. Psalm 119. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. All words, like bees, should soothe and heal, like that Proverbs 15 again. All words should be fruitful and edifying. All words should enhance and transform lives. If not, we run the risk of our own words coming back to sting us. Yeah. You know? They said in verse 27, the Lord hates us. And then they read their own words. The Lord hates us. Then they rebelled. And they condemned themselves and were defeated. Even the Lord of this land, you know, even the Lord of this land, in this instance, not always, definitely not always, but in this instance, concords with the Bible. The Lord of this land concords with the Bible here. Now, I heard this a lot when I was younger. Right to me here. Anything you say kind of will be used against you in a court of law. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one. But the Bible said it first. Every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Wow. The Bible says it first. The Bible's always first. We don't need science to prove the Bible. It should have been around, man. Come on. It should have been around. The Bible's the truth. By our words, we are either acquitted or condemned. Don't sting others or you might die. We just read it. And let's not get stung ourselves. We'll take a break there. Let's take a break. Yeah, give, give thanks. Um, we just had some wonderful uh, food. It was uh, a blessing. So we give our Lord thanks and praise for that. And I hope it, during the break that um, you had time to digest uh, what the scriptures tell us. And uh, I hope it was a blessing to you all. So we're going to continue with chapter 2. Deborah chapter 2. And we'll go through right, uh, the whole chapter here. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skated Mount Seir for many days. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skated this mountain long enough, turn northward, and command the people, saying, You are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore watch yourselves carefully, do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land, no, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Sayyid to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. And when we passed beyond our brethren, the descendants of Esau, who dwell in Seir, away from the road of the plain, away from Elat and Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by way of the wilderness of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because they have given all to the descendants of Lot as a possession. The Emim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession which the Lord gave them. Now rise and cross over the valley of the Zered. So we crossed over the valley of Zered, and the time it took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of the Zered was 38 years, until all the generation of the men of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the midst of the camp 
until they were consumed. So it was when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me saying, This day you are to cross all, uh, over at Ar, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near the people of Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. That was also regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there. But the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anachim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place, just, the, just as he had done for the descendants of Esau, who dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them. They dispossessed them and dwelt in their place, even to this day. And the Avim, who dwelt in villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftarim, who come from Kaftor, destroyed them and dwelt in their place. Rise, take your journey and cross over the river Arnon. Look, I have given into your hands Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. And I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedamot to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will keep strictly to the road. I will turn neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot, just as the descendants of Esau who dwell in Seir, and the Moabites who dwell in Ar did for me until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord God is giving us. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass through. For the Lord your God hardened his heart and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into your hand, as it is this day. And the Lord said to me, See, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to possess it, that you may inherit his land. Then Sihon and all his people came out against us to fight at Jahaz. And the Lord our God delivered him over to us, so we defeated him, his sons and all his people. We took all the cities at that time, and we utterly destroyed the men, women and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. We took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves, with the spoil of the cities which we took. From Aroha, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and from the city that is in the ravine, as far as Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all to us. Only you did not go near the land of the people of Ammon, anywhere along the river Jabbok, or to the cities of the mountains, or wherever the Lord our God had forbidden us. Now there's some touchy stuff in there, near the conclusion of that chapter. Um, and we're going to... Um, I was... I was going to skip it. I wasn't going to um, speak at all on it. I'm talking about where um, people were destroyed, uh, men, women and young ones, I thought. But I was prompted to speak on it, so we will be, we'll touch on that. We will touch on that. So, okay, let's go back to where we started. And I'm going to jump in at verse 3. You have skated to this mountain long enough, turn northward. This is beautiful, this actually. It's, um, so we're at the mountain and we've got the Torah that the Moses has given us the law, you know. Um, the people know what it is. Moses has uh, relayed it back to them over and over. And then he says, you've been at this mountain long enough, turn northward. And it doesn't really mean anything. You could just read that and then just start reading the next sentence. You say, what does it mean, turn northward? So you look at the original source again, and this in the Hebrew, north is, northward is Zafana, Zafana, and it's from the root word, Zafon. Now, in the Hebraic mindset and in Hebrew, if something is north, it's um, it's associated with being dark. Like if your house faces south, for example, you're getting the sun all day. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you face the north, it's it's considered as the dark, so something hidden, right? So this northward in the Hebrew, it's it'd be written as like hidden uh, hidden wood, you know, northward hidden wood, i.e. something you go into the unseen, you know, it's obscure, and then. This way is Zafan, which is derived from Zafan, which means hidden. And then by implication, treasure. You know, words evolve, you know. So if something's hidden, where are you going to put your treasure? Where you hide your treasure? Treasure's in a hidden place, you know. So God's saying to his people, look, you've got the letter of the law. I want you now to pursue the spiritual application too. And... You will find hidden treasure there. The spiritual is the unseen. I want you to go into the unseen now, <coughs> and you'll find hidden treasure there. You know, that's beautiful. It's the beauty of the Hebrew language. It just brings the scriptures uh, more readily available and uh, more alive than, than it would have first seemed even in English. So God's saying to his people, you've got the letter of the law. Now pursue the spiritual unseen application of it now. You know, and there you're going to find hidden treasure. Yeah. Verse 29. This is King George of Britain, um, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and Tsar Nicholas of Russia. Now, these were cousins, and during World War I, um, millions of people all over the world died in horrendous wars, uh, in horrendous ways. And uh, basically, these three sent people to their deaths through war. Um, you remember in the first chapter I mentioned rulers and the common people well these were rulers uh, over most of the world at the time between the three of them and then so you look at these who were ruling over the common people I consider all of us here the common people you know none of us are in this world royalty you know in our Lord's world we are um, we've got someone called the Prince of the Air in this world, you know, we know who that is. But um, I just wanted to see, I don't believe that this family, they said that this family was at war with each other, right? And I don't believe that, actually. Um, and they said, well, yeah, but the Russian monarchy all got uh, exterminated, didn't he, by the Bolsheviks in the revolution, 1917. Well, I wasn't there, so I can't prove that. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's your story to say that. Look, I'm going to make a point to you, see, because what I do know is that these three practically condemned millions to their deaths. And history books, like I said, claimed that the Russian monarchy was annihilated by the Bolsheviks, the revolutionaries. It might be true. It might be true. It, but then again, it might not. History books claim lots of things, right? <laughs> history books claim that we come from monkeys. History books claim that we walked on the moon. I don't believe them. Is there any truth in history books? Maybe, probably some. Yeah, probably. Are there any lies in history books? Most definitely. Most definitely. Do I read history books? No. No, I don't. I read and I believe the Bible. And if I want to read history, it's in there. I don't believe man's history. I believe his story. All the history you'll ever need to know is in here. The Bible is true. It's history is true. The word of God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. We read that in Romans 3. We can trust the words that God speaks. Now, if we detect sometimes in the Bible what seems like a discrepancy, then the error is with us. And there's something here in today's Parsha. If you remember back in Numbers 20, Moses sent messengers to the king of Edom, not to the common people, but to the king. He sent messengers to the king of Edom. And he said, we won't cut through any field or vineyard or drink water from any well. And the king sent an answer back. 
you may not travel through our land or we'll come out and confront you with the sword. Right, so Moses saying we won't drink water, blah, blah, blah. And then we read today in verses 26 to 29. I sent messengers from Kedemoth to Sion, who words of peace, let me pass through your land. I'll keep to the road and neither go left or right. You shall send me, sell me food for money, water for money, blah, 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 just as the descendants of Ed, Esau who dwell in Seir Moab, just, just as the descendants of Esau did. I think, well, Numbers 20 said, you're not going to drink any water and you're not going to travel through our land. But what's happened here is, see, we may look at that, or the casual reader may read the Bible and say, the, the, the Bible contradicts itself, man. But no, the, the contradictions are within, within ourselves, never within the Scriptures. We did pass by, but we went along the borders, not through the heart of the land. And on our way, it was the common people gave us meat and drink. The common people of Edom, of Esau, sold us food and drink. Not the king, and none of the king's armies. Think back to Egypt, when the Pharaoh saying, enslave these, make them work harder, don't even get them bricks, make them make the bricks as well. Right? There's going to be common people in Egypt thinking, this is our king's sick, this is wrong. You know, I like these Hebrew people, these are alright, you know. In fact, you know what, I think I, I want to save their God, I don't want to save Pharaoh. This is the common people. So we passed through along the borders and it was the common people that sold us meat and drink. They provided food and water to us, maybe even wine. <laughs> in direct opposition to the wishes of their ungodly king. Mm -hmm. The common people were kind to us, strangers to them really. I know we're brothers, but they don't know us. It's a different land. The lineage is brothers, but these are strangers of a different land now. The common people were kind to us, not their king. It's always the common people. Remember the the common fishermen who came disciples. You remember the mixed multitude in Egypt, mainly commoners, who joined us in the Exodus, said, I'm coming out, I want to be with Jews. We are not listening to him. We're not listening to him. We want to be with Jews. Remember the common Mary and Joseph who raised Yeshua? They were common people. We're told throughout scriptures we are to love our neighbour. Love the stranger, cheat them kindly. And sometimes it's our neighbour who shows us how it's done. We're supposed to give them water, even when the so-called rulers wish that we didn't. That's the way we live in now. Water's life, the word is life. <coughs> We're to give them words of truth and light, of love and life. As, all, as always, Yeshua once again shows us the way. Read John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word. <coughs> so we've been taught in this passage here to repeat the words of God, his Devarim, <coughs> Mishnei HaTorah. Repeat the words of God, spread the gospel, not just to our close friends and our neighbours, but to the stranger and to those who don't know us. Because we've got to love and be just to the stranger. The children of Esau did for us. We ought to also. We took all his cities at that time and we utterly destroyed the men, women and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. Now this is what I was referring to earlier. Now this event here, which I wasn't going to speak about, but I got prompted to, so I had to. It's not an example of being under the ban. You get, get this term in the scriptures, under the ban, and that means just to wipe out everything, everything. What's called harem, harem in the Bible. It's not an actual example of being under the ban. Because uh, you've seen verse 35, they, they kept livestock and some plunder. So that means it wasn't totally under the ban. But it is, it is an almost identical scenario to, to harem. And it is equally equally uncomfortable to read 
So Cherem, say, well, what does it mean utterly destroy, or does it mean devoted to God? Because there's a few interpretations. Well, it's both actually, and it's more. Cherem is, like Jack said, under the ban. It's prohibition. It's sanctity. It's destruction. It's devoted to God, and it incl includes things and people being wiped out. Um, now I've read, I've read scenes like this before in the scriptures, and I used to think. It doesn't mean all. It doesn't mean all, you know. It doesn't mean all. Maybe it's just some kind of saying, you know, just um, a bit like you said, well, our football team just run riot. They didn't run riot at all. They just won like 4 0. It doesn't mean they run riot and started looting and pl plundering places. I saw so this harem, it doesn't really mean all. It's just like a saying, you know. It can't include women and youngsters, surely, surely. Um, but then, with deeper study, you see the Bible. It, the Bible can't be read casually and then just then used to accuse God. You know, it, it, however uncomfortable certain things may be. So, how do we get to understand or accept all this? It's written there. You think, well, is, oh God was a God of love. What's what's this about? One start. One good place to start is that when you look at the instance of the Cherem in the book of Joshua, which is the book after after this, Deuteronomy, um, all those battle, all those examples of Cherem, they predominantly target the Anachim, which is the de descendants of the, the Nephilim, the uh, demonic offspring. So that's a good place to start. You think, oh, I, I, what's going on here? Okay, it's demonic, okay. And bear in mind also, while we're studying this and trying to understand it, bear in mind that God's ultimate plan is to redeem mankind, yeah. not to wipe people out. It's to redeem mankind. Right? That's his ultimate plan. Luke 9, and this is Yeshua speaking, the Son of Man didn't come to, come to destroy <laughs> men's lives, but to save them. Now yeah. this is God speaking, to, didn't come to destroy, but which comes to save them. So you got it's it's almost paradoxical, but you've got to somehow line it up. John 3, For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So, okay, yeah, that's the truth. So, there's got to be something seriously wrong, seriously wrong going on, in order for God to impose a ban, a harem. To put something or somewhere under the ban, something seriously wrong must be going on, because he said, "Look, I've, I've come to save the world. I'm not condemned. I want to save the world. I come to redeem mankind." And then this is going on. So something seriously wrong is going on here. There's many things we don't understand, and that's okay. There's a lot of stuff we don't understand. That's okay. We can't know everything. The only God knows everything. We're not God. Yeah. It's okay not to fully comprehend everything that God does. Everything he says, it's okay not to. He's far above us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. There's much about God we can't understand. And think of the book of Job. A quick look at Job chapter 38. That should suffice. You know? I'm sure we're all familiar with it, where he says, where were you when the uh, put Pleiades up there, by the way? Where were you when the stretched out the, the, uh, the heavens like a tent over the earth? Where were you when they put the water, the water under the earth? And he's speaking in such grandiose terms that we can't even begin to contemplate the awesomeness of God and his, his wisdom. So for anyone struggling with anything in the scriptures, I would refer you to uh, Job 38. Uh, please do read that chapter. Now, Plus we know, because it's written, we know because it's written that God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone, even the wicked. He takes no pleasure in that. So this harem, you think, yeah, but women and children. Somehow it's an act of mercy. Somehow it's an act of mercy. It's beyond us, but God has the greater plan and he, he sees the bigger picture. It is beyond us, but God has the greater plan and he sees the bigger picture. And don't forget, 
didn't God the Father permit his own child, his only begotten child, his son, to give his life so that we may live? So he knows what's going on. He knows. For me, this is the key. Being under the ban is life-saving. It's saving life somehow. Mm. For God to put something under the ban, he's saving life. His own son, our Lord, just used the key here. Somehow, it's for the greater good. It's preventing something that would have been catastrophic. And we know from scriptures itself that the dead in Christ shall rise first. That means all innocent blood. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Whether you're a martyr, or a man, or a woman, or a child. And remember, God knows what it's like to lose a child. God knows what it's like to lose a child. But as I said, he had a plan. He had a bigger picture going on. When a city's placed under the harem, all that is living there has to be put to death. Men, women, children, livestock. But it's of the utmost importance for us to understand that the Lord is not ordering a mindless act of violence. That's just something else. The harem is first and foremost meant to prevent spiritual contamination. Harem is a necessary evil. That's what it is. This image here of the gangrene toes. To save the foot and to save the leg and ultimately to save the body, these toes have to be removed. Spiritually, these toes represent the demonic bloodlines, the genetic mutations, and the animal-human hybrids that existed in great numbers in those days. These, these beings that existed, they were overtly, I mean overtly, publicly, sick, dark and twisted. They were publicly engaged in all manner of heinous atrocities. That it's unspeakable, you couldn't even... Unspeakable, repulsive and hideous I mean, truly diabolical, truly diabolical, devilish, satanic. So this harem is a necessary evil. For me, harem is a foreshadowing of the lake of fire. Yeah. This is the final solution for evil. You see, that's, you know, no one's, no one's like, oh, the lake of fire, no. But it's the same thing, really. It's the same thing. If God orders it, God knows, he knows what's happening. Look, you may not understand when a mother or a father tells a child, look, don't be doing that and you're on the cross anyway and you get hurt. I told you. The child doesn't understand. The child learns to do what mum and dad says. You're going to be all right. Sometimes you just don't understand. You're thinking, oh, my mum hates me or my dad hates me. No, 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 he loves you. And this is for the reason. You don't understand this, but I do. Take it from me. And it seems horrific when we're reading it, but... It's the final solution for evil. And God is loving and merciful. And still there's always hope and redemption for those who turn back to him. And I believe that this even applies to anyone whose lineage is tainted. And we have examples. Uh, Ruth the Moabite. You know, Noah Moabite and Ruth. And she's an ancestor of our Lord. Rahab and her household. Who believed and trusted in the one true God and was saved from the ensuing harem. You know, so there's always hope for those that turn to God. If you don't want to know God, well, where are you going? It's our own choice. Really, it's our own choice. God gives everyone free will. There's the other side too. When this harem is going on, you think, well, someone has to obey this. You know, it's not just the so-called people who are going to be put under the ban. What about the people imposing it? It's um, it's all being. God's orders to impose this ban, this harem. But when God speaks, it's time to listen. We're being taught that we have to listen to his words, his debarim. We are to obey, yeah, even if and when we don't understand. We're supposed to shema at all times. He tests our loyalty, he tests our obedience. Remember Jericho? 
circling the city day after day, day after day. You think, well, why? Because God says so. Oh, okay. God says so, so it's going to go around seven days. Okay. Marching with trumpets and shouts. Why? God said so. See what happens now. Joshua's army obeys and carries out the Lord's commands. The Lord's words, his Deborian, to the letter, exactly. And the result is a complete victory every time. In each battle, Joshua fully obeyed the instructions of our Lord and carried out the harem as commanded. Israel saved the Lord all the days of Joshua. Is it any, any coincidence that jo Israel prospered during Joshua's lifetime? I don't think so. Now the uninformed or the ignorant reader may think that God condones or even encourages gratuitous violence. You can't just casually read that and then start accusing God. The truth is, everyone in this world, everyone in this world is completely reliant on God, our Maker, our Creator, and on everything He does and says. God always provides for those who are faithful to Him, and He will wipe out evil. He will protect and provide for all that are loyal to Him. How do we know? It's in the next chapter. In chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, he says to the Reubenites and Gadites, But your wives and your little ones and your livestock, I know you've got much livestock, shall stay in your cities which I have given you until the Lord has given rest to your brethren as to you. There's wives and children right there. God promises rest to his people. And we can all be his people. We can all be his people. That those that were put under the harem could, could turn to him. Yeah. Just like Rahab and her household and they were saved. It's our choice. He gives us the choice. It, you either follow him or you're following someone else. Okay, we'll move on to verse 37. Only you did not go near the land of the people of Ammon anywhere along the river Jabbok, or to the cities of the mountains, or wherever the Lord our God had forbidden us. See, once again, like the Cherem and, the, and the, the boundaries that God sets, and circling around Jericho, God tries his people's loyalty, and here he's trying the loyalty again by forbidding the people to meddle with the wealthy countries of Moab and Ammon. He's saying, don't meddle with them. Do not meddle with them. And they were wealthy countries, you know, they had a lot going on that could be like quite alluring if you're that way inclined. And then he gives, our Lord gives them the possession of the country of the Amorites. God, out of his love, gives us boundaries. We've heard this in previous passages. And if we keep away from what God forbids, then we shall gain through our obedience to what he says. Our obedience to his words. This is what the lesson is here in chapter 37. How God's word is alive. God's words are life. What he says is intended to promote life. Everything he does. Everything he says. Yeshua in John 6 says, The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So whatever God does or says is intended for life. And he gives us this power too. Our words, our devarim, can heal. Our words can save lives. We mentioned the recent podcast um, about going from the cell to the well. How uh, our Lord can bring people out from captivity into the truth and freedom in his truth. And... I think it, the power of words and people are stuck in cells inside prisons and people who are outside take it upon themselves to be pen pals with them and they write them letters and they uplift them and they encourage them. I, I wonder to myself how many lives have those people saved 
through the words that they've written. No, they're actually saving lives. They're truly saving lives. I say, you, you, you see people topping themselves in prison. I mean, you know, I've witnessed it myself. I mean, I didn't see anyone hanging, but the whole place got shut down and there was the cell there. And I was in the cell once and the blinking noose was still there. This is how fast they get people in our cells. I got moved from one cell into another cell and there was a noose hanging from the middle of the ceiling. Wow. The power of words, power of words can save lives and they do. I've witnessed it. A simple, you can be in the street, a simple good morning can save a life. You don't know what's in that person, what, what that person's carrying on their shoulders and what they've decided to do that day. And you say good morning and it's just shook them out of their little bubble and ah oh, good morning and then a little chat. It's the power of words. We've got death and we've got life in our words, people. What about what about I love you? What about how are you? Or you're wonderful or Yeshua loves you. Words are so powerful. Words are so powerful. And the word is living water. Water transforms death to life, just as the word does. Water and words sustain life. Water and words cleanse and heal. Just like water, the word will wash away greed, addiction, lust, anger, all uncleanliness and all sin. John 15, Yeshua says, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Because of the word which I've spoken to you. So the words of our God are like water. They're like water. Finally, coming towards the end of the pasture, let us see how his words are also a light. His words are a flaming torch, a lamp. Proverbs 6, for the commandment is a lamp. And the law, the Torah, a light. Just like light, his words sustain life. Just like light, his words banish the darkness. Second Samuel, for you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. So you can speak words into people. Psalm 119. This is the Psalm of Psalms 119, isn't it? The Psalm of Psalms 119. And here we are, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, I'm going to show you, I want to share something which is the word is inextricably linked to the menorah. It says here in Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet. In the Torah, this word for lamp in the Hebrew is ne. Okay? The word for lamp in Hebrew is ne. And in the Torah, it's only ever used, this word ne, in relation to the menorah. So let's have a look. We read in Exodus 25 about the menorah, don't we? It's one piece of hammered pure gold. It's something really special. Exodus 25. You don't have to go there. I'm going to read it out anyway. So we just get a brief reminder of how it is, what it, how, it's com how it's composed, what it looks like, etc. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch, with an ornamental knob and a flower, and so forth, the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece, all of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. Now we see, there's many references in scriptures, so I'll just get straight to the 
the point. Yeshua is at the centre. Yeshua is at the centre. He's the main stem of the lampstand. He's the main stem of the menorah. He's the vine. He is the vine. He's the source. For us to bear fruit, we have to be connected to him. Those who hear his words and abide in his words, abide in him. All is one. And he is the light of the world. He said it himself. He's the light of the world. Our Jewish brothers and sisters called the menorah the light of the world. And Yeshua said, I am the light of the world. He's the menorah. He's the source of our life and he is the light in our life. But there's more, there's more here. And this it really starts getting very interesting. Now when Yeshua says that he is the vine, he says that in the book of John. It's the last of a series of statements that he makes using the same words. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, this reputed, the repeated use here of I am reminds us of the time at the burning bush and the name that God gave to Moses by which to call him. Remember when Moses said, so what do we say when he asked me what your name is? I am, yeah. What shall I say? When he said, I am. Aye, I, share aye. I am who I am. Or it can be translated, I will be who I will be. It's generally, I am who I am, but this is what you should use your to. I am who I am. He said, I am, I am, I am. Before every Ham was, I am. And he's saying this, you're thinking, well, isn't that the name that God said to Moses, call me I am. And they were just even picking up on this. And then he's saying, I'm the light of the world. And they're looking at this and thinking, hang on, uh, it's all linked. The issue is implying that he's the vine from which all life comes, basically. That he is indeed God as the Son. The choice of the menorah's construction would have reminded the priests of the first manifestation of God to Moses, his encounter with the burning bush. For me, the details of the construction particularly depict an almond tree. The oil lamps on top of the seven branches mirrored the fire that existed without destroying the bush. Like that. I believe Moses would have seen something like this. Wow. All these things point us to the word of God which first came to Moses from the burning bush. Looks like a menorah. I am. I am who I am. I am the light of the world. But besides these parallels of the menorah being like an almond tree and representing the burning bush, this Moses saw. And thus the word spoken to him that illuminated his path, by the way, to redeem Israel from Egypt. This, the, there are more links, there are yet more links between the, the menorah and the word of God. The menorah, when dismantled into its respective parts, consists, consists of the following. It has seven branches. It has eleven bulbs. It has nine flowers and 22 bowls. We've just read the, the description. Someone might know where we're going here. The only feature that we're not told about in scriptures is the actual height of the menorah. That's not, that's not explicitly told. But ancient Jewish literature on the Book of Numbers claimed that it's 17 handbreadths. Some say 18, but some say, well, no, that's including the base. Just the menorah itself is 17 handbreadths. Now that's all we've got to go on. So let me continue and we'll see if that's plausible. Okay. So now we have seven branches, 11 bulbs, nine flowers, 22 bowls, 17 handbreadths. And probably by now you're thinking, why is all the significance and how do they relate to the bear being a lamb, Tommy? What, what are you saying? Well, let's consider the so following Psalm. Once again, Psalm 119. This sign, verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And you're thinking, the entrance of his words, what does that mean? What could it mean, the entrance of his words? I'm going to suggest here that the beginning sentence 
of each of the five books of the Torah is referred to explicitly as the entrance to his words in Psalm 119. I'll show you what I mean now. So I'm suggesting that the beginning sentence of each of the five books of the Torah is the first words, is the entrance that we see in Psalm 119, the entrance of his words. Genesis 1, 1. In Hebrew, it's all in Hebrew, not in English, probably not in any other language, only in Hebrew. Genesis 1, 1 contains seven words. The menorah has seven branches. Exodus 1, 1 has 11 words. The menorah has 11 bulbs. Wow. The Viticus 1, 1 has nine words. The menorah has nine flowers. Numbers 1, 1 has 17 words. The menorah has 17 handbreadths. Deuteronomy 1, 1 has 22 words. The menorah has 22 bowls. 7 plus 11 plus 9 plus 22 equals 66. That's the menorah. The 66 books of the Bible. So the word of God just all comes together. It's just mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah. And obviously we just consider the first five books of the Torah here, but we know that the whole scripture, the whole Bible is Torah. It's all the word of God. It's all a Torah. And that Yeshua is the living Torah. And that the word is a lamp, all of it. Kal Devarim. Kal Devarim. Okay, well, to conclude, we'll draw the two conclusion now. Like most of us sat here and online and on Zoom, like most of us, I've read a lot of good books in my time. Has anyone here read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huggleberry Finn? Anyone? No? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Never mind, I have. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, Lord of the Flies by William Golding, anyone? Yeah. Uh, the, um, to Kill a Mockingbird, anyone? Brilliant book. Of Mice and Men? Yeah. Great Expectations? Yeah. You've seen the film. <laughs> the books are always better. Animal Farm, uh, 1984 by George Orwell. These are all great books, aren't they? They're great books, you know. And they're all full of words. <laughs> they're all full of words. Here's another book. Has anyone read this book? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the Bible. Not that one, no, but the yeah. film. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy... You know, what, what a blessing to have, I don't You know, so yeah. long, not so, so long ago, no, you know, you had to go and listen to it read out. The Bible, the Holy Word of God, is full of words, full of Deverim. But this is a life. This is alive. Forget you of my cement or to kill a mockingbird. Great books, yeah, but come on. This is alive. Now, as far as God is above us, this book is the book of books, man. Forget any other book. And if you like geography or history, it's in here. If you love the truth and you thirst after it, this is it here. These ways, these devarim are alive. So, so what are we to do? Well, in the words of Moses, Deuteronomy 6, thanks, bro. Moses says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them, or repeat them, diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way. In other words, when you walk by the way, we ought to be a light to our neighbours, to the stranger. We ought to be words, we ought to be the Torah, the lamp, the menorah, Yeshua, the light of the world. We are to provide everyone out there we meet with water, living water, Yeshua. He washes, he cleanses, he gives life. That's what we're commanded to do. And it goes on, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be frontlets between your eyes. So everything you do, everything you think. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. What you see, what you hear, what you speak. And on your gates. All these words, Kal Deberim, are maybe the most, maybe the most important, or maybe the most well-known words in scriptures, are the ten words, the so-called ten commandments, the ten words, Aseret, Hadibrot, or Haseret, Hadeberim, 
the ten words. Now we know that our God is the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. Now in these Aserets had he brought the ten words, the ten commandments so called, had Eberim. They begin and end. He's the beginning, he's the end. They begin with, I am, I am the Lord your God. And they end with, your neighbour. God's ten words, the ten commandments, begin with, I am, and end with, wow. your neighbour. Wow. That's once again in a Hebrew version, and some of this, to be honest. <coughs> so that concludes, um, Parsha Devarim. I hope, um, I hope it inspires us to be uh, the love and the mercy and the beauty that is that is our Lord and our God. Amen. Have a blessed week. Via con Dios. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.